Welcome to another episode of Bitfinex Talks. I'm your host, Ricardo Martinez. Today, I'm here with Gabber Gerbax. Gabber is the uh, strategy advisor at Van Eck, and he's also the founder of the Pointsville app. Gabber, how are you today? Hey, Ricardo, thanks for having me. I'm very well. How about you? I'm doing great, thanks. Um, Gabber, the reason I had you on the show is because I'm familiar with your work, mostly um, tweeting about Bitcoin ETFs and Van X journey to get an ETF approved by regulators. Um, I know you guys have been approved in the EU. How have investors responded to the Bitcoin ETF product since it's been launched? It's been a long journey working with you know Van Eck on getting a Bitcoin ETF approved, ETPs approved around the world. Um, in uh, Europe, um, after we worked on it at least for five years uh, to get one approved, we managed to do that. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it's one of the top traded funds, uh, the Bitcoin one among uh, crypto products uh, in in the EU. Um, the Bitcoin uh, ETP is available in uh, 14 countries, and they're, they're, it's listed on uh, the Deutsche Börse, Zetra, uh, as well as Euronext. So, we managed to find a way to get Bitcoin into Europe's largest exchanges, uh, which is a great journey. And again, um, you know, from our side, it's five years plus of work with regulators and eight years of work behind the scenes, just ourselves getting comfortable to get there. I sort of feel like I got 20 years older in this, <laughs> you know, the last eight years. But uh, the uh, so finally we got there. And um, I'm hoping that at some point the US ETF is going to be approved as well. Um, just so that our listeners uh, know, uh, US ETF uh, right now is not available in the markets. We're hoping they would be they would get approved um, next few years. I don't have a specific time that I could give. Can you speculate on why the US regulators are moving slower than their European counterparts? I think the um, you know, there's uh, so there's no good reason why not to approve a Bitcoin ETF. It's just you know, I have uh, probably hundreds of tweets about <laughs> the benefits of what ETFs bring to the uh, market, which includes just price discovery, safety and security, instant proof of reserves, uh, tax documents, uh, again, uh, and, and, and some protections that come with traditional market instruments. So there are no good reasons that why not to approve an ETF. Historically, at least over the past five, seven years, the narrative was that um, you know, are there good enough pricing sources for a Bitcoin ETF? Now we proved that yes, there there is. We built the first regulated uh, index series with our uh, subsidiary market vector uh, indices. So those have been the first regulated crypto indices in Europe, and the regulators like that. So we solved the price discovery issue um, in Europe. We've been working with a regulated bank, um, actually out of leakage time, and so we have uh, that going for us. A bank holding Bitcoin um on balance sheet and you know that was that made regulators happy and we also shown that uh bitcoin is not uniquely uh prone to market manipulation and uh again over the years they've been just open to approving an etf uh, in the us i think there's been just some political turmoil and wrestling <laughs> around the bitcoin etf so i always say that regulators are just using this uh, Bitcoin ETF approval for their political platform. Um, that's the only rational reason I can see. Um, one of the things that people suggest that uh, the Bitcoin uh, spot platforms, so, you know, think uh, the likes of, uh, obviously, there's a Bitfinex podcast, uh, <laughs> but, you know, Bitfinex, Coinbase, uh, Binance, that the SEC should regulate those platforms before. Uh, approving a, a Bitcoin ETF, but obviously that's nonsense because it's not in their jurisdictions. Uh, Bitcoin is a commodity, not a security, and uh, uh, commodities uh, are not regulated uh, in a way uh, like you know there are gold ETFs today. There's more than fifty billion dollars worth, actually probably more than that, maybe seventy billion dollars worth of gold uh, in ETFs, uh, physical bullion that is, and the gold markets are less regulated than Bitcoin markets less oversight less transparency so um there's again no good reason why not approve uh, a bitcoin etf in the us so to me it's going to happen the question is whether it's going to happen uh you know during this administration or the next uh you know, my guess it would be the next if i had to speculate uh and uh and democrats haven't been too friendly um uh, to be honest uh to to bitcoin um and uh yeah, but until then, you know, the um, exchanges like Bitfinex have done an excellent job 
basically giving direct access to Bitcoin to people and the big winners from this, uh, SEC not approving uh, exchanges, I'm oh, sorry, uh, ETFs is the exchanges themselves like Bitfinex and uh, you know, that's also just a more crypto native to the way to deal with Bitcoin. If you are an exchange, take self custody if you want, trade if you want, not have to have a traditional vehicle. Again, long term, I think it, um, if uh, I could hold my Bitcoin alongside my stocks and foreign currencies and uh, assets, that'd be fantastic. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we're not there yet. The people are just getting comfortable. In doing research for this interview, I noticed that there's actually quite a few Bitcoin ETFs on the market globally. Um, would you say that it's becoming pretty competitive in the ETF uh, product offering? Yeah, definitely. So there are, um, you know, technically most of the ETFs are, are ETPs, exchange traded products. Uh, e exchange traded products are an umbrella term for various things. Exchange traded funds, exchange traded commodities and exchange traded notes. Um, there are some um, exchange traded products that are technically exchange traded notes, meaning they're debt instruments. So sometimes not, no physical Bitcoin are backing them. So there are a number of those products. Uh, our products are physically backed uh, by Bitcoin and as, as a special purpose vehicle holding physical Bitcoin. So those are sort of like a physically backed Bitcoin products. But yeah, there's a competition. Um, you know, uh, financial firms are launching uh, Bitcoin exchange trade products in, uh, in Europe mostly, um, trying to uh, serve their customers. And this is one way that, uh, you know, banks can uh, serve their customers because there's a need for Bitcoin and, and customers are asking for it. So these companies are launching Bitcoin products. Uh, I don't mind competition, actually. I think this is great for the space. It just shows that there's more demand for Bitcoin. How is a Bitcoin ETP different from a product like Grayscale's GBTC, which we've seen in the headlines recently? Well, I could be here for three hours going through <laughs> those in, in details, but let's just, uh, on, on the top level, some of the most important attributes is uh, the the likes of, you know, GPTC are over-the-counter traded products. So they are traded in either a small platform like the OTC board um, and not major exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, or ICE, uh, SIBO, uh, you know, big exchanges or Zetra, Euromax, and so on. So that's one. Listings is a much smaller venue. Uh, then they are not redeemable, um, basically, uh, as ETFs are. Every ETFs are, ETFs is redeemable at their NAS, net asset value uh, at least once a day at the end of the day, depending on where they're listed. It's you know, 4 p.m., 3.30, 5.30. It depends on exchange closures. But you can get the shares of the ETFs at the net asset value. That is not true for the likes of GBTC and closed end funds. Effectively, what happens is you buy shares from the issuer and then you are, you're locked up your shares for either six or 12 months in the US uh, with just a regulation around closed end funds. And then how you can get rid of your shares if you want to sell them is you sell it to the secondary market. Someone else buys it for you. But you cannot redeem it with the issuer at the end of the day like ETS. So uh, what happens then is you see crazy swings in premium and discounts. So with uh, GBTC, GBTC has been at a uh, sometimes an 80% premium trading uh, at the heights of the ICO boom. Then it collapsed to an almost 50% discount after people started selling it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, ETFs tend to uh, trade pretty close to the market prices of the instruments that they represent. In this case, the price of Bitcoin. But um, you know, if you have uh, GBTC, for instance, and you're at a 50% discount, then what you're getting is like 50% of the price of Bitcoin. So um, you know, in this case, a little bit north um, of $8,000, which is kind of crazy. So that's why um, an ETF would be so much better for the market because you would have instant, at least once the uh, day redemption capability, you'd also have the ability to uh, trade it freely uh, among market makers in primary and secondary markets. Um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, and you would have more transparency into the issuance uh, and purchasing uh, of like how the issue, issuer buys these shares because we don't know what DCG is doing with, you know, GPTC shares. We're at the mercy of uh, what DCG and Grayscale are gonna do uh, with their trust and, um, uh, you know, publicly listed uh, exchange traded funds are much more sort of like, you know, they, they have much more transparency requirements. They have exchange listing requirements. So you just have, I don't want to say a hundred times more information available. 
it has to be between 20 and 50 times more information available about the fund. And, and uh, basically, there's a you have a door in and there's a door out as well. Uh, that's not the case with closed end funds. Door in is easy, door out is hard. You've mentioned several advantages uh, from Bitcoin ETPs. Uh, why would investors or funds want to trade uh, an ETP rather than either Bitcoin itself or another security like futures or options? Yeah, so let's start with, uh, so I'm you know, a big proponent of Bitcoin. I think if you own Bitcoin, own it directly. And uh, But you know, the reality of what we have seen is that most people actually leave Bitcoin on exchanges because of convenience. Uh, and uh, if you hold, if you basically uh, hold your Bitcoin on exchanges, some exchanges like Bitfinex are better than others uh, and have a history of uh, being loyal to their customers and working uh, with their customers. But some exchanges collapsed just recently FTX. So in the case of uh, an ETF, um, the shares of an ETF is basically redeemable directly. You wouldn't have to go through the the crazy legal quagmire because you have once a day liquidity and they sure is like, basically forced to give you a Bitcoin back. So that's that's a scenario where you would have more liquidity and more, more oversight uh, for firms who are uh, you know managing these products. Um, the Some of the other advantages too is, again, um, you're holding your Bitcoin alongside um, other stocks and bonds and investments that you have, which actually comes with some insurance protections and you have uh, in the United States, like sometimes you're, uh, depending on the asset, you have FDIC protection, which means that up until $250,000 in your account, at least for cash portion, you're secured. Um, there are, for securities, there are SIPC protection up to $750,000. So for the average investor, you actually have insurance protection for your account if something bad were to happen. The government needs to bail you out, but you have access to that bailout <laughs> and the issuer cannot stand in the in, in the well, uh, sorry, in the in the uh, way. And so that's a big advantage, just high quality companies with access to potential bailouts and insurance funds um, that are you know, nationally recognized and put in place. Um, with respect to futures, I, I actually, you know, I don't think that the average person should trade futures or, uh, or leveraged funds, especially if you're new to Bitcoin, own your Bitcoin, uh, maybe buy a little bit, you know, dollar cost average in and out, <laughs> depending on uh, your objectives. But uh, borrow based betting is not for everyone. I think it's for professional traders. Uh, some of these crypto exchanges have, uh, you know, uh, basically pushed the narrative that you should have all this buying power and you should bet leverage. And, a lot of people lost their shirts, so I don't recommend that. Um, if you are, you know, later down the line, want to borrow, play around, but learn a few years just holding Bitcoin, trading it a little bit, uh, but not not futures. And uh, if you compare exchange traded products uh, on Bitcoin, uh, for instance, to what happens generally in crypto exchanges, uh, there's a limit to leverage, which is usually somewhere between. Um, it's usually two to three times and some uh, jurisdictions is five times, but you have a natural limit to leverage. So people cannot, you know, cannot lose their shirts immediately, like on a 50 X trade or a 20 X trade or a hundred X trade. And uh, so it's one of the big benefits. Uh, but again, an exchange like Bitfinex, for instance, uh, if you hold Bitcoin responsibly and you dollar cost average into trades when you know, you're just buying lows, for instance, I think it's a great behavior and you can have, those good behaviors at a, at a Bitcoin exchange to uh, not just an ETF. In places like Europe, where the regulators have approved these uh, ETFs, are, is it only for Bitcoin or are there uh, other crypto ETFs like Ethereum or, or Solana or, or something like that? Yeah, so I mean, the first ones and the most liquid ones are Bitcoin. So I would say, you know, uh, 70, 80% of the market from a liquidity perspective is Bitcoin. Uh, people understand the story of Bitcoin, uh, which is a store of value, sort of like a digital gold. And while it does not have exactly the characteristics of gold, um, traditional investors get it. So uh, they start with Bitcoin. Um, there are other products that are available in the market as well. Um, Ethereum, Tron, Avalanche um, are some of the examples. Polygon. So those are those have exchange rated funds. Uh, I've launched some of them uh, for for uh, Vanek uh, and uh, you're working with the, these companies. So investors are able to access those funds as well, uh, those assets um, 
through Vanek. Uh, what I'm seeing right now uh, is uh, that mostly the Bitcoin ones are getting used at size and with the with institutional type of liquidity. Um, eventually, you know, but, but some of the, you know, we have a decent size, I don't know, like 60, $70 million uh, Tron uh, ETP. That's kind of interesting. Um, we have decent size Avalanche one, um, Polygon and some of the others. So um, I believe in free markets. So let people decide what they want. And uh, what I do is just design the best way to access uh, these assets. Aside from ETFs or ETPs, uh, what kind of financial products would you like to see for Bitcoin and other cryptos that may be not available currently? So I, I do want to see the US Bitcoin, um, you know, ETF uh, proper approved. Uh, I think that's an important one. I've been working on it for so long and eventually it will happen. Um, and I, I, I don't think that the regulators can hold the gate for too long <laughs> on this one. But uh, the so I would love to see that happen. Uh, I'm really excited actually about XAUT and tokenized gold uh, that uh, Tether has been doing and some of the offerings uh, in the market. Um, so I'm more I'm a hard money fan, so I'd like to see products with Bitcoin and gold, uh, maybe some of them combined, uh, easy access, uh, self-custody uh, capability. So um, so that's interesting. Like, you know, I've been working a lot on uh, getting Bitcoin into the traditional financial system. Uh, but I most actually love this idea of getting, for instance, gold into the crypto ecosystem. So I'm, I'm following very closely what uh, Tether has been working on with uh, the gold products. So uh, the type of products I would like to see again should include uh, Bitcoin and gold uh, in some form because those are hard money uh, type of instruments. In addition to that, I think um, uh, sort of like uh, Bitcoin exchanges, uh, like Bitfinex, uh, the type of service that you know you guys could provide down the line is what I liken to banks. So I call uh, Bitcoin and crypto exchanges neo banks. It's a full service uh, banking capability for individuals who do not have access to uh, banking. This includes uh, uh, my framework for this is that is this: you have a checking account and a savings account. This is not you know not a new framework. This has existed for a long time. In your checking account, you have stable coins and stuff that you spend every day um, in small amounts or whatever you need. And in your savings account, you have Bitcoin, gold, and other cryptocurrencies that you believe in it from an uh, investment perspective. So I'd love to see services that are from Bitcoin and crypto exchanges that have this checking account capability with you know, USDT as a stable coin for spending and with enough merchant acceptance that is actually going very well. Again, it's interesting. And then uh, the second part is the savings account portion. So um, yeah, those are the products I would like to see. Um, contrary to some of my you know, colleagues and peers in the institutional space, I fundamentally believe that Bitcoin and stable coins and cryptocurrencies are uh, individual or retail oriented, not institutionally focused. So I would like to see more uh, retail adoption. Like things uh, that, that comes through merchant integrations, like Bitfinex Pay does. Uh, it comes through some of the work that Tether does with uh, ATMs. The one latest uh, in Brazil, I think it was like 40,000 ATMs are accepting Bitcoin USDT and some of the assets. So those are the kind of things that I'm uh, excited about because it gives power back to people as opposed to intermediaries. Um, I work a lot with, you know, I'm working for an intermediary and, uh, you know, work a lot with institutions. And I think we can you know, create products that are excellent uh, and work for institutions. But I also think that retail folks who and people generally should have access to products directly. We actually have a product that's kind of like the checking account uh, thing that you were mentioning uh, with Bitfinex FastPay. Like in the mobile app, you can pay for stuff from merchants that accept cryptos and you can use Tether and things like that, as well as Bitcoin. And uh, I think there's several other popular altcoins that you can use as well uh with the recent ftx collapse we've seen a lot of uh newspaper articles and, and people uh wanting more regulation for crypto what's your opinion right now on the state of regulation surrounding crypto um we've seen everybody have a different opinion on it so i'd like to get yours <laughs> yeah i mean that's a big question so the uh I, my view is that uh, Bitcoin and crypto in general, it's already regulated. You know, transactions are regulated by FinCEN globally. Uh, 
a lot of uh, crypto exchanges already comply by local regulations and jurisdictions where they operate. Um, I love the approach that Brazil has has done and carried through. They are regulating basically crypto in general and uh, Bitcoin stablecoins under that umbrella as payment. So I like that. Um, I don't like the approach where uh, cryptocurrencies and offerings are securities. Um, I don't think that it's just too high of a board burden and it, it doesn't really apply. So I love the payment approach. Uh, so just to summarize, I think uh, the space is already regulated enough. If we wanted uh, more regulation, it should be more regulation as payment services and payment service providers as opposed to banking regulation and uh, securities regulation. When securities regulation, banking regulation comes into the picture, uh, it just means enormous uh, expenses around processes that don't apply to most of the companies today, like crypto exchanges in the space. So like already I just saw a stat that uh, today with Binance has received 47,000 law enforcement requests. That's more than 100 a day. That's crazy. And uh, I know that you know my friends from Bitcoin and crypto exchanges are saying the same that they have so many regulators already. They're dealing with they're pretty much a you know a, a law sort of like office dealing with these requests. And so, if anything, actually, I would I would think that we need more clarity and less regulation. We don't have to come up with new burdens. Just let companies operate. And um, in the financial services world, actually. Um, we have a framework that would be helpful here. So there, there are self-regulatory organizations like FINRA. Uh, it's the Financial Regulatory Authority. So it's basically a group of firms that come together and come up with standards that people abide by. Like it could be in proof of reserves, it could be in reporting, it could be in trading standards, and it's self-enforced. And uh, most of the time, the self-regulatory organization uh, manages to fix a lot of internal issues and flashes out bad actors and bad behaviors without, you know, the Department of Justice and regulators raining down on everyone. So I would love to see more of that. I guess that would be my summary. And uh, I'm encouraged that, you know, some of the senators that I get to speak to and leaders around the world are uh, rational about this. Most of them aren't yet, despite the fact that, you know, some of us spent 10 years educating them about stuff. Uh, but some of them are getting to this position of, we need more activity, new type of payments, new type of stuff and, and growth. And so we don't stand in the way of uh, crypto exchanges, for instance, but we're gonna define some guardrails or use existing frameworks for payments. So anyways, that's the direction I'm hoping for. Um, although with FTX, it's just a, you know, a big black eye, if you will. Uh, we got hit in the face, regulators are saying that, oh, the industry needs regulation and more oversight and more of this and that. You know, fraud and theft is already illegal. So these guys, you know, one company, it looks like they committed fraud and stole people's money. Why would the whole industry need regulation if there are some bad actors? Like, there are some bad actors in all industry. It doesn't mean that you need to, re like, rewrite the whole banking industry or a whole auto industry because there are some bad actors. You need to punish the bad actors and then move on. So I'm hoping that this moment is not, I mean, right now, uh, regulators are looking to over-regulate <laughs> because it's an opportunity for them. But I don't think that's the right move uh, long-term. So. I think with FTX, like they were really close to regulators as well, like prior to, to the collapse. Um, I want to change the subject again and talk about Pointsville. Uh, can you tell us what Pointsville is all about? Yeah, absolutely. So I have this fundamental belief that uh, tokens are not necessarily evil uh, but all the a lot of coins that are in the market right now are in a zero-sum competition so someone wants to reinvent storage someone wants to reinvent wireless networks and then what they do is they take a big rip a big chunk of tokens and take it for themselves their foundations their aunts and uncles and friends and dogs and whatever and then what ends up happening is the investors get ripped off so I don't think tokens have to be that way. So points, what Pointsville does is we uh, help companies launch loyalty tokens. A lot of them are centralized and we don't have pre-sales, we don't have ICOs and IPOs or any of those, but your points represent basically um, value that you're getting, uh, point value, not dollar value from a merchant, from a big brand. 
and then you can buy a cup of coffee with them. The difference that we kind of brought to this market, this is, this is a model that's known in the airline industry, the hotel industry, you get free stuff when you spend money with someone. So what we do is we just enable the average person, the little coffee shop at the corner, uh, the rock brand, the taxi company, the pension funds, we see companies from all levels to create their own point system. And uh, so that's what we do. We uh, allow the creation of uh, loyalty points uh, without uh, the, what I call the monkey business of tokenomics. And so we, so, so that's what we do. And uh, I'm hoping that a number of those assets uh, will be living on the Bitcoin protocol or will be hooked up to stable coins over time. I saw you tweeting about the augmented reality aspect of it. Uh, how does that all work? Is it kind of like Pokemon Go for, for adults or, or how, how would you describe that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, so I've, um, you know, I, I love uh, geometry, and uh, so I'm a math major, and I when I, whenever so I, I did uh, a lot of geometry in my free time, and and AR is just amazing from that perspective. So I believe that uh, I was not a big metaverse fan, and I did not expect Facebook announcing their metaverse closed ecosystem. But I think uh, companies that are like local, small companies, or medium sized companies, even superstores can directly advertise to users uh, and the use and that's what pointsville does pointsville cuts out the big social media platform uh type of thing and then gives money back what they would spend on advertising to users so it's like a direct brand to uh user uh, bridge and with ar um, most people have mobile phones so i think ar for the next five ten five to ten years will be vr because you can uh, deploy that from a simple computational device which is a mobile phone that many people have around the world and so ar allows us to basically uh, get someone locally engaged with a brand and uh you know use a map or use an augmented reality feature to pick up a token or engage with a board and so i think that's fun i don't know where that space is going um we actually see a lot of our people engage with map feature. Uh, some people engage with the AR, but uh, you know, not not a crazy amount. Uh, but the idea is that you would go to a you know a shopping center, and then you can uh, pick up your points, or your phone gives you a notification. And this is a feature that you'll see at the end of this year. But you, you'll walk by a store, and then you get your five percent discount uh, if you are in that store and if you're buying something. So that's what we are building. I think uh, some of the big companies are have too much baggage and they didn't manage to build a good product. So we have a little bit of an edge uh, to to build this product. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, and all these uh, tokens are sort of like uh, hooked into brands directly that they manage. Um, What's the merchant response been like? Um, how are brands reacting to the idea of Pointsville? Pretty well. So we have started roughly three years ago as a company. Um, and uh, we have so far 80 plus partners uh, and 105 additional brands uh, that are that give discounts uh, from the company. So pretty good response uh, to it. Um, they uh, they like the aspect of making it uh, easy for a user to uh, get their tokens. And uh, the AR thing is just it's fun. Like one of our early um, uh, clients was a, a baseball uh, team uh, in Pittsburgh. And so they wanted fans to come back to the stadium, uh, which was uh, sort of a difficult thing after COVID. So we've launched their, their sort of like AI games and location-based rewards, and a lot of fans came back to the stadium. We have bank clients who uh, put tokens around their branches, and uh, you know they are incentivizing people to go to a bank. A lot of people don't even know that bank branches exist in the U.S., which is a crazy phenomenon. There are all these you know buildings and safes and beautiful branches and people don't go there. So uh, that's uh, that's kind of a cool reaction. And then, uh, you know, we have some shopping uh, centers that we work with and, and they just want to attract customers. And, and so our software has been helpful. Additionally, I would uh, point out that all these big loyalty companies that we work up with um, sometimes manage their whole uh, loyalty program. Uh, some of them, like, one example I can give you is an airline that I can't name, but um, they have so much in loyalty points that they borrow more than four to five billion every year against their loyalty uh, system. But they manage their loyalty points from a, an Excel sheet and a Word document. So what we built is basically a backend management system for their 
uh, loyalty offering. And, uh, and so that helps them just to kind of keep track of who owns what uh, and, and manage their program more professionally. And I, it's just astounded me how big the space is and how much actual money is being borrowed against loyalty points. So anyways, that's, uh, that's one of the, we're just being a, a non-sexy middleware who helps companies uh, kind of organize their loyalty points and maybe, maybe make it more interesting. Um, and so, yeah, that's a rule that I like, but uh, it's definitely not as flashy as some of the crypto projects out there. Is Pointsville only available for people in the U.S., or do you guys work with global brands and people outside of the U.S. can use it also? It's available in most countries, uh, with some exceptions. We have uh, some transaction limitations with OFAC countries that you know Bitcoin and crypto exchanges uh, do have as well at least on the fiat side, but yeah, it's available globally. Um, we have, uh, you know, some of our uh, offerings are restricted on the sort of like cash side in the US right now, but we are actually looking to work with staple coins uh, globally to make uh, some of our services available as well uh, with like cash rewards and like USDT and uh, things like that. So global and, uh, you know, actually the US is, uh, it's a big market for ours from a partner perspective, but it's uh, from a user perspective, it's uh, not our biggest market. My, uh, well, second to last question is, uh, how has the crypto community itself responded to Pointsville? Are they enthusiastic about it? Yeah, so we have, uh, I don't know, like 20 roughly, 20 some um, partners from the crypto community. So, uh, you know, BitTorrent and Tron are one of them. Uh, and then we work with uh, Polygon, we work with some of the Elvins as well. So the idea is that, you know, eventually if someone wants to deploy uh, their loyalty system on a, on a blockchain for whatever reason, sometimes it's not sensible, sometimes it is, they can do it uh, through us. And uh, so they've been very positive and supported uh, us. And uh, we have seen a lot of users who are uh, interested in more sort of a lot of the, the NFT space was just JPEGs for the longest time. And uh, we came in offering like baseball tickets. Uh, we came in like, like basically you're, you could hang out with your favorite baseball player at the holiday party if you had enough points type of thing. So uh, that was uh, favored. It was mostly a US focused kind of effort, but um, it was very much liked. And people were thinking about uh, collectibles broadly. Um, I think NFTs have bastardized collectibles. Like people used to really like collecting stuff and now collectibles are taught as NFTs and NFTs are just, they're just too much for a lot of people. And so what we have done is just, here's real, here's real rewards. Um, it's, you can go to a baseball game uh, you can get 5% back, you know, take that in cash. <laughs> and, uh, and that was, uh, that was viewed positively. Um, although, you know, as of now, which is, I think it's actually a good thing, uh, but most of our clients are outside of the crypto space. So we have healthcare companies, banks, pension funds, uh, asset managers, sports teams, uh, uh, restaurants, and so on. So uh, the reaction from, I guess, the real world <laughs> has been uh, more broad, um, but they, they taught up their also tend to, tend to think about us as a you know crypto-ish alternative, but without the gambling aspect of it. How do people get a hold of the Pointsville app? Is it on both Android and iOS? Yeah, uh, Android and iOS, uh, so apps are available. Uh, we also have a web platform, uh, loyalty.pointsville.com. Uh, that's where you see uh, you know our promotions and uh, we have redeemables and you can earn uh, points by watching videos, educational ones, for instance, about Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, so loyalty.pointsville.com has links to the apps uh, as well as the loyalty platform. So it's uh, you know, pretty easy to uh, to find there. And uh, yeah, if brands want to work with us, uh, you can reach out to any channels on the website or on social, and then uh, uh, our team will get back to you. Um, the cool thing about Pointsville is, uh, like, let's just say you are a coffee shop or a, or a mall and want to launch your uh, loyalty system. Basically, under a minute, um, you can create a loyalty token for yourself. So we can fast launch tokens for any brands. Um, that's why we have seen interest uh, and success um, ourselves. And uh, uh, also, uh, you know, some companies want to uh, white label their solution. So you talk to a big, 
you know, baseball league or a team and they want to have their solutions white labeled to their brand. So uh, that comes by, uh, as by definition, through a product. So you can just kind of own the interface and, uh, and offer loyalty in your token to uh, folks. So I, I'm bullish on that, by the way. I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Bitcoiner and I think from a cryptocurrency and store of value perspective, Bitcoin and stable coins uh, make a lot of sense. And there's some cryptocurrencies that also make sense. But the next uh, level, the next sort of like evolution of tokens is going to be brands launching their own monetary system. And not all these systems will be focused on like making money, but it will be a direct interaction uh, with customers. And actually, this is sort of like will directly challenge the likes of Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn and, and marketing platforms that are being used today. And so, uh, again, so I think like what we are helping with is uh, in the right now, how, how it is is that the likes of Facebook earn money uh, for our eyeballs and views. Now they started paying creators. So you can earn some money now if you're a creator and put content on their platform. But users are not really earning money these days. And so our bet is that with Pointsville and with direct advertisements and work with brands through tokens on, on the platform, uh, the money that's spent on advertising will be spent directly on the user, which forces sort of like local communities and cuts out, you know, Silicon Valley organizers, New York organizers, and the big sort of like tech hubs of the world. So I'm, I'm really bullish on that because in a way it's a parallel to the Bitcoin ethos. And, uh, and we, we sort of, um, we're working on, on Bitcoin and stablecoin integrations as well because we, we share values there. So um, anyways, that's that's why I built Bitcoin because I think it will help with the direct community interactions and brand awareness without the big guys. Gabbert, we were supposed to do a 30 minute interview and we've gone 12 minutes over. It's been a oh, no. pleasure speaking to you, um, but I don't want to take up your whole day. So uh, how can people follow you on social media? How can they keep tabs on what you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. So Gabor Gorbach, um, G U R B A C S, and uh, that's the last name. And Gabor is the first name, G A B O R. Uh, so Twitter, you can find me there, and LinkedIn, it's just find my name as well. If we do business together, <laughs> feel free to add me. Uh, but yeah, um, reach out anytime. I'm uh, pretty low key and uh, excited um, to to work with you. And uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm a bit, big fan of Bitfinex. Uh, and, and sort of like the whole Bitfinex family of company and Tether and so on. So uh, you guys are doing great things for the world and I appreciate that.